Welcome to English Separatists, Exile, and the Plymouth Colony. This is Melinda Cole Klein. Thirteen years after the founding of the Jamestown Colony in Virginia, another group of English settlers came to America after living in exile in the Netherlands. To practice Christianity in England under the current laws made them radical extremists and subject to arrest or detention. According to the historical record written by their second governor, William Bradford, in Of Plymouth Plantation, the pilgrims and their co-colonists, the strangers, as he called them, created a settlement on Cape Cod Harbor in southern Massachusetts. Their story is a familiar one. After two years of preparation and financial arrangements made by the merchant adventurers, the separatists and their English co-colonists loaded their two vessels, the Mayflower, a cargo vessel, and the Speedwell, a coasting vessel that the colonists had intended to keep with them in America, and headed out of Southampton, England on August 6, 1620, bound for America. After several delays and weeks lost, the Speedwell had to be left behind. Months had been lost to reorganizing the journey, and now the summer and fall months were gone. Not a time to sail across the North Atlantic. As winter approached, the Mayflower's 102 passengers, also with 25 crewmen, having sailed through deadly storms, arrived just off the coast of Cape Cod after nine and a half weeks of travel. This English group of settlers possessed a charter from King James to establish a colony on the south side of the Hudson River, legally still within the Jamestown patent but as far away from the Virginia colonists as possible, and south of the Dutch colony of New Netherlands, established on what is now Manhattan Island. But this is not what happened. As the Mayflower colonists were blown off course and could not bypass the shoals off the southern coast of Cape Cod, the passengers were in a legal predicament. Due to the conditions, the captain decided for the colonists that they had to make landfall inside Cape Cod Harbor. The dead of winter in New England was upon them. As William Bradford states, quote, Thus being arrived at Cape Cod the 11th of November, and necessity calling them to look out a place for habitation. Thanks to the literature published for almost a century, any colonists considering the trip to America knew something about their region. After leaving Virginia, Smith explored and mapped the New England coast. He published in 1616 a description of New England. He called it Massachusetts. And it would be in this desolation that the pilgrims and the strangers established a settlement after months of dying from the effects of scurvy. By March 1621, unfortunately, half of the colonists had died. As a side note, I wanted to let you know that according to uh, statistics, recent research, 10% of Americans are descended from the Mayflower passengers who founded the Plymouth Plantation in 1620. Forced conversion of British society from Catholicism to Protestantism altered the social and political fabric of the nation. In Henry VIII's England, established by a set of parliamentary laws, Britain had broken its ties with the Church of Rome. As a result, it fashioned in the 1530s a national church the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church, headed by the king and supported by the government through tax money. Although the position of the new church was secured and the country prospered under Henry's daughter, Elizabeth I, who ruled from 1558 to 1603, 
The break with Rome marked the beginning of more than a century of religious dissension in England. While Catholics hoped and plotted for England's return to Roman alliance, others believed that the break with Rome and the Pope had not been clean enough and needed reforms. This reforming religious group called themselves Puritans, and they wanted to rid the Church of England of its familiar Catholic identity. The religious hierarchy in place with clergy who possessed increasing levels of authority and power, culminating with the king as its head. Next, the elaborate church rituals of ceremony and display. For Puritans, for example, even the king's church itself looked very Catholic-like in manner and practice, with its stained glass windows, statues, artwork, and elaborate cathedral ceilings. Many Puritans were members of an increasingly affluent middle class, landowners of wealth, yes, some aristocrats and nobility, but most were gentry, having created their wealth as merchants and manufacturers. By the 1580s, under Queen Elizabeth, the number of Puritans in Parliament had significantly grown in number. Their voices and opinions, also concerns, could not be ignored. These religious reformers agitated, but stayed within the church to work towards that end. The main movement of religious reform was through Puritanism. There were differences between Puritans and Separatists. First of all, unlike the Separatists that would be accused of treason against their king because of their religious principles and practices, the Puritans accepted the practices of the church and state, and they continued to push for reform. Puritans differed from the most radical of these separatists on the issue of church hierarchy. For the congregational separatists, no hierarchy existed within their religious framework because the congregation voted for and hired their own ministers. Alternatively, Puritans adopted Presbyterian, this is the Scottish Protestants, practice to give groups of ministers power to put pressure, if they saw fit, on an individual church or minister. The small and more radical group of English separatist Congregationalists in Scrooby, 150 miles north of London, established their own churches and oftentimes met in secret, as they were breaking the law. While rituals and practice of worship differed, one foundational principle that later took hold in the American colonies and in the formation of the Republic was the separation of church and state. Separatists argued that a civil authority could not be in charge of a religious body. There should be no connection between church and state. And in this time, that was a very big deal. This one principle alone denounced the authority of the English monarchy as the head of the English church. Together with their austere practices and principles, this made separatists radical. While set apart culturally from other English citizens, they were forced to move to seek religious tolerance. By 1607, the Scrooby separatists moved to the Dutch Netherlands. Like the Puritans who would settle in Boston in 1630, the Pilgrims used their civil authority to create a perfect, godly community in Plymouth. They discovered early the way to do this was to create laws to control moral behavior. The Plymouth colonists were a mixed group of mostly artisans and farmers, although their leaders were often well-educated men, well-read, and enjoyed philosophical debate. In England at the time, such religious radicalism was considered treasonable. It challenged the established social and political order, as well as the religious order. 
1593, an act of Parliament made it illegal to worship in any church except the Church of England. As a result, separatist meetings were broken up and many were jailed. Ministers who preached disobedience to Anglican authority were persecuted and several were hanged, especially under Queen Mary, who ruled from 1553 to 1558, also remembered as Bloody Mary. For hundreds of years, English common law required communities to report crime. If they did not, they could be accused of wrongdoing themselves, such as harboring criminals. The separatists lived in such a time when the eyes of community were upon you. Thus, little went unnoticed. A small group of people meeting in private in the middle of the night might seem suspicious to neighbors. Perhaps a neighbor did not like you. They would report this meeting to the local authorities. Members ended up being watched for private church and prayer meetings by authorities. If suspected, they were arrested. If found guilty, they could lose their jobs, property, or could be fined. By 1607, it had become clear to the Scrooby congregation that if they were going to practice their religion and, according to their precepts, moral living, they would have to leave England. The Scrooby separatists were unable to obtain exit visas to leave the country legally, and their first attempt to leave the country met with disaster. After walking 60 miles to the sea, they were betrayed by the ship's captain who turned them over to the authorities and received reward money. After being searched and relieved of their possessions, they were all sent to jail and detained for about a month. Over the following months, small groups of separatists were able to make it to the Netherlands while others were captured on the beach and imprisoned. Later, many of them were able to escape, rejoining their families and friends, waiting for them in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, the pilgrim congregation from Scrooby moved on to Leiden. However, in Leiden, they were once again discontented as the years passed. First of all, there were cultural differences, such as the food, use of activities, and the influence that it made on their children. And then in Leiden, there was the poverty that they endured as they lived in the low-rent district. They, after all, were farmers, most of them, and lived on meager wages in this industrial setting. The effect the Dutch culture was having on their children most concerned them. Late by the 1610s, members of the Scrooby congregation decided the Dutch were a bad influence on their children. The pilgrims felt their children were losing their English culture and faith. By 1617, the congregation had begun talking of moving again. Perhaps it could be to the wilderness of America. Perhaps it would be there that they could build an English godly society. The impoverished pilgrims could only dream and discuss their options. Because their king did not want them back in England, though he felt it was his duty to be their king as they were his subjects, in time he agreed to give them a patent to build a settlement north of Jamestown rather than have them back in England. To be able to afford the transportation costs and initial settlement, the cost to supply the trip for the passengers and to provide them with enough supplies after landing until they produced a first harvest, the pilgrims had to borrow money. In all, it came to about 1,400 pounds sterling. In today's money, this is about $100,000. This was much too expensive for them to fund themselves. So they entered into a legal and financial binding agreement known as a joint stock venture with a group of London investors 
willing to underwrite the hefty costs. In late July 1620, 46 pilgrims boarded the Speedwell in Holland and sailed for England on the first leg of their journey. There were about 90 more colonists waiting in Southampton to join with the pilgrims whom the merchant adventurers recruited for the settlement. These co-colonists were waiting to sail on a second ship, the Mayflower, holding additional supplies. The two ships would leave Southampton, England on August 6th, but after a week returned to port when the Speedwell continued to leak. This happened two times. In all, a month was lost to these efforts. And in the end, the damage to the Speedwell proved not to be repairable, and the small ship would have to be left behind. With winter coming on, the colonists were forced to spend valuable time transferring barrels of salted beef and cod, hogsheads of beer, sacks of smoked beef, cabbages and onions, tubs of pickled eggs and butter from the Speedwell to the hold of the Mayflower. Due to the lack of space, 20 colonists had to be left behind because the larger ship and all the supplies could not accommodate everyone. At last, on September 6th, the Mayflower sailed alone with 102 passengers. The voyage lasted 67 days and was far from comfortable. The Mayflower was outfitted to carry cargo, such as casks of wine. It was not designed to carry passengers. Regarding its size, at its widest, the Wayflower was about 25 feet wide and 90 feet in length. While 25 crew members had cabins, the colonists lived and slept in an open bay without hammocks or bunks, and yes, it was very crowded, very smelly, and with no sanitation. You were expected to relieve yourself by using a bucket on a moving ship. After nine and a half weeks on the open ocean, in cramped, smelly quarters with strange people, the issue of landfall at Cape Cod came close to destroying the already strained relations between the strangers and the saints. Complications included the following. The Mayflower had been blown off course. Now it was 60 to 90 miles from their intended settlement. Therefore, they were outside of their legal patent. The Mayflower's captain attempted to rectify the situation by sailing around the Cape, towards the Hudson River. However, the vessel came close to running aground, could not navigate past the rocky shoals off the southern coast, between Nantucket Island and the Cape. The captain had no choice but to sail north and find a safe landing around the Cape and after resupplying, it was his duty to return the Mayflower to England. Determined that the pilgrims should not have everything their own way in the new colony, a number of strangers, the other English people, declared that after landing, they would be on their own, subject to their own authority and no one else's. Pilgrim leaders knew that with winter coming on, that the colony might not survive without the aid of every able-bodied man. They also believed that without a system of government accepted by all the settlers, the colony would be torn apart and dissolve into anarchy. Because the pilgrims had their own religion, they had experience in self-government. Their ministers were elected by a vote from the congregation Bible interpretation was publicly debated in a town meeting type of fashion. The pilgrims also had a model document for a form of self-government in the covenant they signed and lived by as a community in the Netherlands. 
Consequently, before the settlers left the Mayflower, a compact was drawn up between the saints and the strangers for the good of all. The original manuscript of the Mayflower Compact has been lost, but it has been recorded in William Bradford's History of the Plymouth Plantation. This document by itself did not plant democracy in America, but it does serve as evidence that the separatists, having created their own religious branch of Protestantism, had experience in self-government. And this political leadership experience served them well here, in this crisis, at hand, off the coast of New England, in the dead of winter. Keep in mind the decision to settle in New England was one of necessity. The Mayflower colonists neither wanted to be in New England, nor did they possess their legal rights to settle there either. On the day of the signing of the Mayflower Compact, about 12 armed passengers went ashore. While there is not an official record of this landing, it is believed to be located at what is now referred to as Provincetown. The passengers gathered wood, explored the land, and watched for Indians. While using the Mayflower as a temporary home, the men continued to explore the surrounding areas during the daylight hours. They searched for game and fresh water supplies. Because water on land and on sea is often contaminated, the pilgrims drank large amounts of beer, like most Europeans and yes, the children too. Unfiltered beer was considered a portable food source known as liquid bread. This medieval styled unfiltered beer is identified today as in the past as a sustainable source of calories and nutrition while it had a low alcohol content of about 5%. The daily ration of beer aboard the Mayflower is recorded at one gallon of beer per person per day. Yes, the passengers and their children consumed a lot of beer. By the time they landed off the coast of New England, William Bradford writes, quote, Our victuals are most spent, this means low on food, especially our beer. After multiple visits on shore by the men, the exploring party discovered an abandoned Indian village. This is known as Patuxet. William Bradford notes, quote, being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed God of heaven, who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean to set their feet on the firm and stable earth. Sometime between Smith's explorations and the landing of the pilgrims, the Wampanoag natives and other regional tribes had died in great numbers, wiping out entire villages. This is believed to be a time between 1615 and 1619. William Bradford writes later after more about the village was understood and how it was vacated, quote, of some great pestilence. For the pilgrims, the abandoned village had religious overtones. The pilgrims saw this as a sign from God to settle in Patuxet as it was cleared for them. It was likely that a European trading ship with local natives in the area had exposed them to smallpox, killing most. Because of settlement difficulties and weeks needed to scout for a suitable location, the Mayflower had served as a makeshift home for the colonists for months. Once the colonists chose the small harbor area with the abandoned village, the colonists worked together constructing a storehouse by cutting planks for walls and floors, mixing a mortar from powdered seashells, and gathering tree branches for roofing materials. Early Plymouth buildings such as the storehouse provided passengers with a temporary land-based living quarters. 
All the while, the women and children stayed on board until January. Scurvy and the Great Dying Why were Mayflower colonists and the crew becoming sick? So I have four points for you I'd like you to think about. Number one, the dampness and cold. The wet feet from jumping in and out of boats on the shoreline. General freezing temperatures combined with hard work, poor diet, and the consistent fear of Indian and wolf attacks made the winter months extremely difficult. Number two, all the while because so many colonists and crewmen were sick, it was necessary to turn the Mayflower into a temporary hospital. The captain could not yet leave as his passengers were not well enough to disembark. It took weeks to build their wooden structures with the few people who were well enough to work, and he had not yet procured supplies for the trip home. Number three, the diet of the colonists due to their limited resources by now consisted mostly of salted meat and hardtack biscuits. Number four, by January the colonists were suffering from scurvy. This disease which likely caused the deaths upon the settlement was due to the lack of vitamin C. The human body, if it goes without fresh fruit and vegetables for over 45 days, begins to break down because cells in the way they should be formed, known as collagen synthesis, is not occurring. Liver spots develop on the skin. Limbs don't work. People feel faint, depressed, and sadness sets in while they feel very tired. As a result, they began lying down in an attempt to feel better. But when the colonists did lie down, their lungs filled up with liquid and pneumonia set in. Ancient Greek and Roman mariners were well aware of this problem, putting into port regularly for supplies. But weeks earlier, the Mayflower colonists ran out of fresh fruits and vegetables and their source of beer as well. The last of these were cabbages, kegs of unfiltered beer and onions. The rate of illness increased. Pneumonia and tuberculosis took their toll on the colonists. After the winter months, only 50 Mayflower passengers remained alive. The Mayflower left Plymouth and the colonists on April 5, 1621. The Mayflower returned to England without any sellable goods in the ship's hold. Since the first governor, John Carver, elected by the Plymouth colonists died, by popular vote William Bradford was elected. With Bradford as governor for most of the years between 1621 and 1656, the colonists enjoyed a continuous alliance with the nearby Wampanoags. In addition, Bradford wielded great influence, leaving an indelible mark on the Plymouth Plantation colonists and their community. Had Indians attacked the settlement during the first winter, surely the colonists would not have survived. Smoke from distant Indian fires had been seen on numerous occasions and stranger William Standish had stolen tools made by Indians. After a dozen Indians were seen near Plymouth, a colonial meeting was called to establish a colonial military organization. It was decided that Miles Standish, a stranger and military captain, was given the authority to manage the colonial military affairs. While the meeting was in progress, an Indian boldly walked down Plymouth's main street towards men assembled in the common house. This native greeted them in English and bade them welcome. His name was Samoset, a member of the Wampanoag tribe, and explained to the settlers that he learned to speak English from fishermen who traded with them along the New England coast. While the colonists were uneasy at first, Samoset proved to be a valuable friend to the colonists. Soon after, Samoset returned with Squanto, 
the only known Patuxet left in the area. The reason for this is simple. He was not there when the great pestilence hit his village. He had been kidnapped by a Spanish exploring party, sold into slavery, but later escaped and returned to New England on an English vessel. After Squanto did return, he found his entire village wiped out by disease, making him the last Patuxet. He went to live with the Wampanoag tribe. Squanto proved invaluable to the Plymouth settlers in regards to diplomatic efforts between the Wampanoag and the Plymouth settlement. In addition, Squanto showed them how to plant corn using fish as fertilizer and how to trap for food. As recorded by William Bradford on March 7, 1621, with the help of Squanto, the settlers planted crop seeds obtained from the Indians. Thankfully, those who were going to die did, and the terrible winter was coming to an end, although their desperate struggle would persist for years. It would be that fall the colonists and the Wampanoags celebrated, over a period of three days, the harvest with a thanksgiving to God. By 1625, the Plymouth settlers experienced a bountiful year and harvest, giving them optimism about the future. One of the reasons for the good harvest of 1625, William Bradford believed, was a change in the policy regulating land use. At first, the land of the Plymouth Plantation was held in common. The yield or bounty was shared equally by all. More and more, however, the younger men complained they did all the great part of the work and deserved a greater amount of the crops. In 1623, Governor Bradford bowed to the will of the community and allotted individual farming plots of land to each family. The results were similar to those in Jamestown. Everyone became more industrious. More corn was planted and the women began to accompany the men into the fields for work. Pilgrim records frequently mention the abundance of fish at Plymouth, indicating the settler's concern for producing sellable items that would bring in a profit to the colony's sponsors. The contract with the London merchants provided that the settlers would share in the profits once their original debt was paid. This was expected to take about seven years from farming, fishing, and colonial trade. However, the colonists were unable to produce profits to repay the debt in this way, in this timely manner. In 1627, they made a new agreement with the merchants paying off the debt at 200 pounds a year. The group sent supplies such as shoes and other necessary manufactured goods, thus accumulating more debt. It would not be until 1648 that the Plymouth Saints paid off their debt in full. Unlike the Jamestown colony that could not pay back the money they borrowed, and continued to borrow that drove the Virginia Company into bankruptcy. Plymouth Plantation was not a democracy in the modern sense of the word. Nothing stated in the Mayflower Compact indicated that either the saints or the strangers believed that everyone should have a voice in government. Women, servants, children, and other dependents that were not property owners were not given this right. Unlike voting men and women over the age of 18 in America today, there were no landless adult men in the Plymouth Colony who voted. This privilege was reserved for property owners. The Mayflower Compact represents the first instance of self-government in America a group of people deciding for themselves how they wish to be governed. It does not represent the establishment of a fully democratic society, a government of all the people. 
By 1643, the Plymouth settlement contained about 3,000 colonists. This society, in the majority, was dominated by the separatists. According to the historian John Demos in A Little Commonwealth, he identified six roles of the 17th century family. With this history of the Plymouth settlers, the practices within the British culture of the 17th century and their responsibility to their community are revealed. The function of the colonial family is as follows. Number one, it served as a business. Each household was more or less self-sufficient and its various members were united in the work of providing for their fundamental wants. Number two, the family was a school. Parents and masters were charged by law to attend to the education of all children in their immediate care. Number three, the family served as a vocational institute. It clearly served to prepare its young for effective, independent performance in the larger economic system. The great majority of persons becoming farmers but it applied with equal force to the various trades and crafts of the time. The ordinary setting for an apprenticeship was of course a domestic one. Number four, the family served as a church. The obligation of family worship seemed to have been widely assumed. Daily prayers and personal meditation formed an indispensable addition to the more formal devotions of an entire community. Number five, the family served as a house of correction. In such cases that the court deemed persons criminal or idle due to their own laziness, they were made to live as servants with families of more reputable citizens. The household seemed to be a natural setting for both imposing order and discipline, for encouraging some degree of character, reformation, and a positive environment. Number six, the family was also a welfare institution. It was occasionally a hospital, for at least some men were thought to have special medical knowledge and could take in sick persons on a day-to-day -day basis. The family also served as an orphanage in that children who lost their parents were transferred into another household. In addition, the family also served as an old people's home since the aged and maybe they were not so well could live with another family because they could not care for themselves any longer. They were usually incorporated into households of their grown children but this was not always the case. And lastly, the family was a poor house for obvious reasons. The performance of these functions was a concern shared by the entire pilgrim community. If and when a family failed in its duties, such as to properly discipline their children or regulate their household, the government of the colony intervened directly. By 1691, with the new Massachusetts Charter under the reign of William and Mary, the Plymouth Colony was absorbed into the larger Puritan Colony of Massachusetts Bay, founded in 1630.